Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. I know it's a lot different than what we had planned originally. Certainly a whole lot different than we did last year. But, hey, we're dealing with what we have to deal with. And as I was getting the sermon together, I started thinking, you know, I am a creature of habit. It's coming up on Christmas. I automatically turned my Bible to Luke chapter 2, and I started reading through those scriptures. And I remember my father reading that passage of scripture every evening on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, depending on when all the family could get together and exchange the gifts and things like that. And it's just tradition. That's what we do. We do things the same way every year. We do things, like I said, we're creatures of habit. But this Christmas is none, not at all like any other has been. And everything's a little different. So, for this Christmas sermon, I actually went to the book of Matthew. Matthew 1, 1 through 17. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles, go ahead, just put me on pause. But you wish you could do that in real life, don't you? <laughs> but no, you can't. Go to Matthew 1. Easy to find, the first book in the New Testament. I got a couple dogs here, and they're going to help me with this sermon, so please uh, please try to put up with them as, as well. So, like I said, this is a tough Christmas. Not only do we have the problems with the COVID, really complicating things, but we have the traditional problems as well. People have lost people that they love. People are missing people in their lives. People are experiencing financial hardships, uh, pressures at work, pressures at school, um, whatever it might be. I mean, we have the traditional struggles, if you will, as well as new with the wearing masks everywhere you go and being afraid of contracting this virus and giving it to someone who may not have the ability to fight it off. Struggling with, am I acting in faith or am I being weak? All of these different things, and so this certainly doesn't call for a traditional Christmas sermon. I want to bring you some hope this morning from these scriptures, and I hope that it touches you the way it did me. So we're going to start in Matthew 1, starting with verse 1. So this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinadab, Abinadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Okay, so now you're thinking, what, what's he doing? Why are we reading all these, well, as the King James Version says, begats? This is a part of scripture, a lot of us, be honest with you, a lot of us skip over. Who begat this one, who begot that one. But yeah, this really is our text this morning. Let me keep going. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. All right, do you, I got time to turn this guy off and uh, look up another sermon on Facebook? Bear with me, guys. I think you're going to understand what I'm trying to get to here. Because we see all, all of these people who were involved in the line 
in the line of, of Jesus. Because this passage here finishes off. It says, after the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shetel, Shetel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abihad, Abihad the father of Elikim, Elikim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Akim, Akim the father of Elihud, Elihud the father of Eleazar, Eleazar the father of Mathan, Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there were fourteen generations in all, from Abraham to David, fourteen from David to the exile in Babylon, and fourteen from the exile to the Messiah. Many of us needed to hear a message of hope this morning. Some in our church community are very discouraged right now, very upset. Miss having traditional services, miss being together. There's a grayness that's overshadowing our lives, and I understand that, and I feel it too. The season we're in, to be honest with you, makes it worse, not better. I bet a lot of you have struggled with just even getting in the Christmas spirit this year. I mean, I have too. Over my shoulder, you'll see our family Christmas tree. And I haven't had a live tree since I was a kid. Uh, and we chose this one. We chose a live tree because we needed something, <laughs> something different. And, and we wanted to have, we thought maybe if we got a live tree and we change things up, it'll get us more into Christmas spirit. And to be honest with you, it really didn't, <laughs> but it, it helped. It certainly helped. So I bet a lot of you did the same type of thing almost forcing the Christmas spirit to come around. That's why I found this genealogy and I started looking through it. And I realized, you know, Matthew crafted this very carefully because he wanted a message of hope. Now, the book of Matthew was written primarily to a Jewish audience and these genealogies are extremely important to Jewish people. But one of the things that I saw in this, in this genealogy that Matthew had written, was a plan. Remember the old A-Team episodes? The old TV show? Some of you remember, and I'm not talking about the movie with Liam Nelson. I'm talking about Tuesdays at 8 o'clock on NBC from 1983 to 1987. The A-Team. Murdoch. Face, B.A. Baracus, Colonel Hannibal Smith. Those were cool guys. They'd meet out truth and justice the American way. They would, there were cars and their cool van, plenty of guns, things blowing up. It was a show you could watch with no sound and still understand what was going on. You could set your watch by it. 30 minutes in, the A-team would be stymied by the villains. 40 minutes, they'd go about setting a trap for the villains. It always involved a lot of shooting, a lot of blowing things up. Sometimes assembling a large vehicle like a tank. Stuff that they conveniently had laying around that always came together. Setting some kind of trap. Very cool montage music. 50 minutes into the show, the trap would be sprung. A high-speed car chase would ensue. Blazing machine guns, car crashes, explosions. Not one single character ever getting killed. And the A-Team would always emerge victorious. And George Papard, he would breezily exclaim, <clears throat> I love it when a plan comes together. Remember him saying that? Usually he had a big cigar and he'd light it up. I just love when a plan comes together. What Matthew wants us to see from this genealogy is exactly that. A plan coming together. A message for hope. As we head toward Christmas, that is God's plan. And God's plan always comes together. Let's look at this a little more closely. God always has a plan. His plans never fail. 
much unlike ours. And his genealogy from Abraham to David, it shows that God's plan includes mercy. Descendant of Abraham. That means part of God's promise. Descendant of David, royal lineage, credibility as king. I love that there's four women mentioned in this genealogy. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. These women were not perfect. Just like all of us. Just like you. Just like me. They were a long way from perfect. Tamar seduced her father-in-law Judah into an incestuous relationship. Rahab, she's the one who hid the uh, Jewish spies. She joined the Israelites, but she was a pagan prostitute. Ruth, she was from Moab. She was a Gentile. And Bathsheba... Well, she, she entered a messianic line because of an adulterous affair with David. You see, the genealogy from David to the Babylonian captivity, it shows that God's plan, despite sin, is going to succeed. At the onset of the Babylonian uh, captivity, the exile when the monarchy was destroyed and what was left of the nation, it was transported to Babylon. It would have been in... Uh, 587 BC. And from that time on, there was no heir to David. No one sat on the throne. But now, Matthew is saying, or he's arguing actually, that a descendant of David, Jesus the Messiah, had come to take the royal throne. It was rightfully his. And it was time for a descendant of David to sit on the throne again. The genealogy from the Babylonian captivity to Christ it shows something different. It shows that God's plan always comes together, that it succeeds. You see, Christ was not only a son of David, but of course was the son of God. He's listed as a descendant, not of Joseph, but of Mary. Think about the history summed up in this genealogy, guys. I mean, there's a lot here. Take your time and look through it. It's marked by gross sin, Blatant idolatry, captivity in Egypt, captivity in Babylon, <clears throat> succession of flawed kings, hostile enemies, yet God's plan still carries on to completion. It still comes together. It's like God is saying, the famine in Egypt couldn't starve my plan. 400 years of slavery in Egypt and 70 in Babylonian captivity couldn't shackle my plan. Murder, corruption idolatry, could not stop what I want to do. God tells us, folks, my plan always comes together. Remember back in 2003, the news conference, the, in the morning after the beginning of the attacks on Iraq, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, he was asked by a reporter about the apparent failure to follow the war plan. And Rumsfeld, he replied very dryly, he said, I don't believe you have the war plan. You see, we often follow, or we approach God with a question like that reporter. Why doesn't he follow the plan we expect? Why doesn't God do things in a way that makes sense to me? Guys, you know I love you all, and I know you love me. But we know each other, right? And it does not take long for any of us to look at each other's lives and see where we failed. We've had plans not come together. We all have things that we wish we would have done differently in our lives, and we have all made mistakes. We can't be the ones in charge of the fate of mankind. We'd be extinct as a species a long time ago were it not for God. As God told Job and countless others since, I don't believe you have the plan. I remember after reading after Job had lamented and lamented and lamented, and, and hey, I'm not, he had it rough. I'm, I'm not discounting what he went through, but the scripture where God, he says, were you there 
Were you there when I made it all? Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you were. And he had to remind Job that he was God and Job wasn't. And you and I need to be reminded of that as well. We make decisions that not everybody's happy with. And we look at things that we wish had went differently in our lives. We look, look at things that we wish were going differently right now. But we don't have a whole plan. I don't know what God is doing right now. I'll be flat out honest with you. I don't know what's up with this COVID thing. I don't know what's up with the economy. I don't know what's up with the presidential election. I don't know what's up with the the global catastrophes that are going on. I, we don't know. But the important thing is we know that God is still on the throne and God is still in charge. Jesus is a king of divine promise, ordered and preserved by God for the right to rule his kingdom. With, when your life seems out of control, God is always in control. And he wants to manifest the rule of Christ in your life to bring you hope, faith, and peace. And you can know that to be true. Because God's plan includes flawed people. Sinful people. Yet his plan always comes together. It's not us. It's his plan. We've talked about the women, but let's talk about some of the guys in this genealogy. Abraham, man, he lied worse than Pinocchio. Jacob, well, come on, guys. He conned his father, he conned his brother, his father-in-law. He was slicker than a, than a Vegas card shark. Judah, he committed incest. He was a hypocrite and a, an adulterer. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Manasseh was a wicked king. Sacrifice his own son to an idol. These guys, they were bad guys. They were flawed. They had character issues. They were sinful men. Why did God use them? Why didn't God find perfect people to use? <laughs> we know the answer to that, don't we? You see, God knew we'd be warriors. And he wants us to know that he is in total control. The proof is in the last name on the list, Jesus, the Christ. He wants us to know that if he can include these guys on this list, these women on this list, he can include you and I. You see, God's plan, God's plan always comes together. God is always in control. The God who loved you enough to step off of that throne, be born in that lowly manger, loves you enough to hold your life together during all the problems that we're encountering this Christmas season. We are not doing Christmas the way we want to do it. Simply put, we are not getting what we want. This is not the time for us to stomp our feet and have a little tantrum. This is a time to be thankful to God for what we do have. I love you guys. I miss you guys. I wish it were different. I'm sorry that it's not. But what I'm not sorry for is that our God is still in control, that we still have the love for one another in our hearts, <clears throat> And that despite the problems that we're going to have and the, the COVID-19 restrictions and the financial consider and all, all the things, I'm not going to list them all again. We still have our church because we are the church, not that building over on Anborn Drive. It's you and I, all of us together. Give each other a call, give each other a text, communicate on Facebook, social media, whatever your platform is. Let's remind one another that we love each other. Even if we can't meet on Sunday mornings at 1030, we love each other. And that's what's the most important thing. Let your love for one another continue to bring us close. Worship the God who gave up the glory of heaven 
for a dusty old cattle stall in Jerusalem and Bethlehem that eventually led to a dusty hill in Jerusalem and a boring grave. I love you guys. Have a Merry Christmas.